Well, Comrade, there's, um, we have uh, quite a lot of ground to cover because you are dealing with perhaps the greatest revolutionary who ever lived. Uh, of course, we are, we are gathered here uh, in this camp for young comrades to uh, uh, help us raise the level, isn't it? The political and theoretical level of the comrades. And the reason for that is a, is a practical one. Uh, because we are entering a very stormy period in Britain and internationally. Uh, we can be faced with uh, revolutionary convulsions in Britain. And of course, uh, our task is to bring them to fruition. Uh, but that requires, uh, uh, well, it requires an organization, for want, well, for want of a better word, it requires a party that is able to lead the working class to power. Now, um, obviously, uh, this question of Lenin is central to this. I think perhaps most uh, comrades here, not all of them, are, are members of the International Marxist Tendency, which is the, the world party of socialist revolution. And uh, our tendency rests upon the, uh, the shoulders of giants, really, uh, of Marx in particular, of, of Lenin, of Engels, and of, of uh, Trotsky. And of course, uh, uh, that is the, is the foundation, the rock-solid rock foundation on which the organization is built. And uh, we are different from other, if you like, parties or organizations, uh, insofar as a reformist party is always considered uh, a party with a short memory. Uh, what is a revolutionary party a revolutionary tendency is a long memory in order to learn the lessons of the past to prevent the disasters which have occurred repeating themselves in the future. And of course, um, you know, our task is to prepare for the future. That's what we are doing here. We can't improvise a revolutionary party on the basis simply of events. When the revolution breaks out in Britain, as it will do, revolutionary Revolutions will occur all around the world. But you can't then just spontaneously uh, develop a party. It has to be prepared years in advance for those events which are to, to come. And that was really uh, one of the key features of, of Lenin and the development of Bolshevism. And for us, Bolshevism is not a, an historical you know, term or concept. It's a, a living term. We, we are Bolsheviks. We base ourselves on the Bolshevik tradition uh, as far as our movement is, is concerned. We are, in, in one sense, and it's been repeated in many ways, we are a hardline Marxist-Leninist organization. Uh, we defend the fundamental ideas against all the, the reformists, the revisionists, and so on, who attempt to distort and twist these ideas, uh, which are and are, are, if you like, being proved in practice. Um, these events that we are facing now, which are stormy events, after all, today is the, the third day of the strike, the rail strike, which is shaking Britain, shaking the working class. But it's only the beginning of a movement that's going to rock the whole of society uh, because there's no way out. And on this basis, consciousness is going to be transformed. But on a capitalist basis, they can't solve the problems of the working class. And therefore, inevitably, uh, in this hard school of capitalism, the working class will be pushed towards the idea of revolution. Uh, and our task is to understand that and to prepare the ground for that. You know, the British Revolution will occur whether we are here or not. The point is, is it going to be a successful revolution? And that will depend upon ourselves because no one else is going to do it. And therefore, we have an enormous responsibility, I would say, on our shoulders. And that's why we, we want to learn about Lenin and Bolshevism, not just to inspire comrades, but to encourage comrades to, to read and to master for themselves the real ideas that we represent in the, in the movement. Of course, um, Lenin himself was... Um, a product, first and foremost, of the, of the, of the conditions within Russia itself. Uh, born in 1870, uh, Russia at that time was dominated by a dictatorship, a czarist dictatorship. 
uh, very backward country, semi-feudal relations in the countryside, uh, a population dominated by peasants, 150 million peasants, and a very small working class concentrated in Petersburg and in, in Moscow. And um, Lenin himself didn't come from the working class. Like Marx and Engels, they came from middle class, the upper class. But they, they became the, the greatest revolutionary leaders of the working class movement because they broke from their class and all the privileges they could have had and put themselves on the standpoint of the working class. They devoted their lives to the emancipation of the working class. And uh, I would say that uh, Lenin obviously uh, mastered the ideas of Marxism from a young age. I mean, his, his, uh, his background was affected by the conditions in Russia. Russia the attempts by a young generation to overthrow Tsarism, um, mainly through the Narodnik movement, which was um, based on individual terrorism. They wanted to assassinate the, uh, the Tsar, hoping that that would change things. The pro problem is you assassinate one Tsar and they put another one in his place. That individual terrorism does not work. But unfortunately, his, his brother heroically participated in one of these... Uh, enterprises to get rid of the Tsar and uh, he was caught and along with the other young people were, were hanged and therefore that had a big effect I would say on the young Lenin who was still in school at that time. His brother had, had, uh, had become a revolutionary and was hanged by the state um, and these you could say that Lenin was quite an, a very intelligent uh, young man and he began at a thirst for ideas and uh, First of all, he had sympathies with the Narodniks, that's for, that's for sure. But then began to uh, be affected by these ideas from abroad called Marxism. And uh, because Russia obviously was, a, was a, as I said, uh, a totalitarian regime. There was censorship. There was very, <laughs> the ideas of Marxism weren't circulated in, in a big way. But nevertheless, they percolated into the movement itself. And um, uh, the young uh, Lenin was able to... Um, uh, get hold of these, these uh, writings and learn from him for himself. And he did master them, really. You know, he, he, like a, the thirst was there to conquer them. What is this Marxism? And he read everything he could get his hands on. Um, he, uh, he managed to get to university, like perhaps a lot of you did or do. Um, he went to Kazan University, but he didn't last long. I think he lasted about four weeks. Uh, he was expelled, of course, for, for revolutionary activities. And um, he could only uh, resume his studies, which was to study law, um, after a long campaign by his mother to try and clear the family name and you know, get, get him back on, onto the education ladder. And he managed to get into St. Petersburg University, not, as a, not physically, but just by writing a thesis from, from, uh, from, from afar, shall we say. And he was eventually got a degree uh, in law. And at that time, in his early 20s, 21, 22 years of age, he then realized, having studied this Marxism, it was incompatible, really, for a lifestyle of a lawyer, as far as he, he was concerned. And realized for himself he needed to, for, you know, for basically make the sacrifice of um, devoting his life to the revolution in uh, not only in Russia but also internationally. This is a very young man and uh, in St. Petersburg he established a, a group, a very a small group, a circle at that time um, of young workers and, and students, uh, the emancipation of, 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 uh, of the working class movement. Uh, but um, obviously this is illegal work and he was soon uh, arrested and uh, the punishment he received was uh, internal exile for three years. Whereas the British Empire, as you know, if you got, uh, got into trouble with them, they would um, you know, send you to Botany Bay or you know, uh, Tasmania. You know? But uh, Russia was such a vast uh, uh, country, internal exile was enough because they, such, such was the distances to completely isolate you. And uh, he was condemned to three years in, in Siberia. And... Uh, in a sense, he used those years productively to study more, 
the ideas, nothing much else he could do but to study, to think about how to take the movement forward and how to emulate the, the, what was happening in the West. It was in the West, in Germany, France, Italy. These, work, these were organize, big organizations, uh, working class organizations were built and they adhered to the ideas of Marxism in the Second International. All the, the socialist parties, the big socialist parties at that time were grouped into the Second International. And they formally were, were Marxist International. And uh, the young Lenin believed they needed a party like that to be established in Russia. There was an attempt actually to create one in uh, 1898. A small group got together, it was the founding conference. It lasted a week, they were all arrested. So it didn't last long. The only thing they left behind was a, was a, a manifesto. That was all they had. Uh, and this, but this had a big impact on, on Lenin. He was in touch also with other people who had gone into exile, forced into exile because of the, because of the conditions. A man called Plekhanov, who established a small group in, uh, in Switzerland, you know, uh, the Emancipation of Labour group. Only half a dozen people trying to fight for these ideas of Marxism in Russia, trying to smuggle back, uh, you know, uh, uh, different copies into Russia of, of the works of Marx uh, and Engels in particular. And... Uh, but Lenin not only absorbed these ideas uh, in a serious way, which I think is an example perhaps to everybody, the serious one, uh, seriousness in which he, he didn't uh, just light-mindedly skip over ideas, he tried to thoroughly understand them and therefore read and, and thoroughly tried to grasp what they were getting at, which stimulated his whole approach, you know, what he was going to do when he got out of exile in 1900, for instance. And he, he had certain correspondence with people about the establishment not of the party necessarily, or the re-establishment of the party, but the beginnings of that, which is the establishment of a newspaper. If they could get a newspaper, a Marxist newspaper, that could be the focal focus around which uh, the, the elements could, could develop of a party. Uh, he later called it the, uh, like the scaffolding, you know, in a building. This would be the framework. And um, he uh, went and saw Plekhanov after, after he was released in 1900. How old is he then? 27 years of age, I think he was. Yes, 27 years. I mean, in, in, oh, sorry. When he went into exile, he was 27. By the time he came out, he was 30 in 1900. So it's a relatively young man who'd gone through all this experience and now has been thrown into this cauldron to try and found a revolutionary party in Russia. Um, he brought out, uh, he wrote extensively in, in Iskra. He edited it together with others. He even came to London on that basis. But um, he wrote a book called What is to be Done? Uh, and that book had a, is, is, is a, quite a classic because in there he argues that first of all the conditions in Russia, you can't have a kind of a party like in Britain and so on, where you know, this is going to be a revolutionary party that's going to be used to, to lead the working class to overthrow the old order. That has to be built up of professional revolutionaries who are prepared to dedicate their lives in order to carry this through. He says, there's no point in an amateurist, uh, you know, uh, setup. It's got to be a dedicate. After all, he said, that revolution is not, a, you know, an incidental thing. It's not an easy thing. It's an enormous, it's, well, it's a life and death question. And therefore, you have to have serious people who are prepared to carry it through. And therefore, he wrote this, this, uh, this uh, uh, booklet where he says that, um, you know, that uh, without revolutionary theory, you could have no revolutionary movement. Theory was the basis of it theoretically training cadres, people who are prepared to give their lives to the movement, was the key aspect, and that's what he put forward. And, that's a, and that tendency around Iskra, this newspaper, won a majority of the, of the circles in Russia. There was other confused ideas at the time, I haven't got, into, I haven't got the time to go into them, about uh, economism and legal Marxism, but obscure ideas at the time, to water down the ideas, and try, he, they combated those ideas, and by the time they established a new conference, which in reality was the founding conference, in 1903, um, they, Iskra had won a majority of, of the opinion of the delegates. The majority were, were supporting this, the ideas that Lenin and Iskra had been uh, arguing for over the previous two or three years, uh, which is an amazing achievement. And in this co Congress, they hammered out the fundamentals of what this party was going to be like on the national question about reformism and revolution, the character of the party, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and the interesting thing about this, I did write an article uh, uh, recently, I think in the Social Appeal was carried, about this Congress, where a split took place. The Iskra was the dominant uh, force. Everybody, all the, the majority of delegates, and suddenly there was a division in the ranks of this Iskra. And the division wasn't very clear to begin with. It was over like secondary, as you would have thought, organizational questions. What is a member? How do you define a member? Uh, who should be on the editorial board? You wouldn't think these are sort of earth-shattering questions. But Lenin, in particular, the faction he led at that time, uh, was called for what I bet they were known at the time as the Hards, as opposed to the other tendency that was there around Martov, which was called the Softs. They had a more softer attitude. Lenin had a more harder attitude. That was the kind of difference, quite a, a strange way of, of looking at things. But he was a bit of an anticipation of what was going to come. It was an ant anticipation of political differences that were going to emerge a year or two later. And what, they, they, what the significance of it, they then became, they had a vote at the end of the day, I don't want to go all the ins and outs, but the Bolsheviks and Bolshevism arises from the name of majority. And Menshevism and Mensheviks arose from, from the, as a, a Russian word for minority. So it was only a question of majority and minority within this historical conference at the time. The Bolsheviks were the majority and the Lenin, and um, uh, they uh, carried the day, but it led to a split. Quite a bad split, really, and uh, people walked away uh, disgruntled. Lenin tried to explain what had gone on. What, let's get to the bottom of this. And what he was saying was, the party had to be professionalized, and there were those who didn't want the professionalization. They wanted to make it like a more of a loose-knit, kind of amateurish body kind of thing, you know, open to particularly the middle class intellectuals, you know, who could come and go, that kind of thing. Whereas Lenin said, no, you need a firm revolutionary party based on discipline, based on, you know, a courageous work, uh, movement and, and membership, not a, not a loose-knit loose, a loose party. Um, and, that, and that was the split in 1903. And, and it began this idea of Bolshevism and Menshevism. But it was on organizational questions. Later it became political. And the political differences were quite stark that the Menshevik tendency, because the revolution in, in Russia was coming. You could see that. But what it was the character of this revolution? Well, it was a revolution to modern, to get rid of the Tsar, to get rid of landlordism, give land to the peasants, and, and bring about national unity of the country, uh, solve some of the basic uh, uh, questions that we had solved in Britain. 200 years ago, in other words, prepared the ground for capitalism, really, modernizing the country. That was the basis of it. Um, and of course, uh, you know, under Oliver Cromwell, you know, that was our bourgeois revolution. Um, but this was a lot later, where the, the working, this young working class in, in Russia now began to emerge and come onto the scene. In fact, that was the big thing in 1905, the first revolution in Russia, the actually arose from the defeat of the war. War actually is the midwife of revolution, which is interesting for us today. Um, they, they, there was a, a war between J Japan and Russia, and Russia was defeated. It spurred on a, a, an impetus to, to revolution in Russia. And that 1905 revolution was a, an incredible uh, year-long event, as a matter of fact, where the working class came to the fore. And the debate, debate in the movement was, amongst the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks thought the revolution, well, it should be led by the, by the bourgeoisie, led by the capitalists, and the workers should be subordinating, supporting the capitalists, because after all, he was bringing in capitalism. Lenin, on the other hand, and the Bolsheviks said, hang on, no, no, no. The, 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 ruling, the, the bourgeoisie in Russia are tied to imperialism. They're tied to the landlords. They're tied to the old regime. They will not play a revolutionary role. In fact, they're going to play a counter-revolutionary role. And that the only class in Russia that was revolutionary was the young working class, which was shown in 1905. And they could win, win over the peasantry on that basis as well. So you have an alliance of workers and peasants carrying through this revolution, which Lenin thought would have a big impact on Europe. A successful revolution in Russia doing away with the Tsar would have a big impact on Europe and would actually spur socialist revolution in Europe, which will then, you know, uh, come back into Russia itself. So it's a very internationalist outlook that Lenin had, very advanced. 
There was one other person who perhaps had a more clearer view, and that was Leon Trotsky at the, at the time. He uh, said, yes, the bourgeoisie are counter-revolutionary, the working class is revolutionary, it should lead the revolution, but it, and it should get rid of the monarchy, and, and yes, give land to the peasants, and, and all those things that the, the capitalists did, you know, along two centuries ago in the West, but it shouldn't just stay like that, it should proceed to carry through nationalization of the economy, proceed to have socialist measures, and this was a, what the theory was of permanent revolution, because if you had a socialist revolution in Russia, which no one had ever thought of, Russia, the most backward country you could ever think of in the whole of, of Europe. How could ever? Marx never certainly thought that. He thought, you know, it would be uh, Britain, Germany, France, the, where the industrial working class is strong. But it was Trotsky who had the idea, no, the working class could come to, a, come to power even before the West in Russia. But of course, it could not complete the revolution. It would have to be the beginning of a world revolution. Because in, in, there was no... No basis for socialism in backward Russia, but if the revolution could spark other revolutions in Germany, France, America, and so on, they then would provide Russia with all the material basis to move towards socialism. In other words, world revolution was the prospect. That's what Trotsky was putting forward, even, even a bit more advanced, if you like, than Lenin at that particular time. But uh, the main, uh, uh, I think, lesson from it was the, the intervention of the, of the Bolshevik party and Lenin in the 1905 revolution and the experience that that gave. Lenin later on said it was a dress rehearsal. What a wonderful expression. A dress rehearsal for a future revolution in Russia itself. He drew out the lessons. He said there's an enormous movement to the working class, movement to the peasants and so on. They, they threw up the workers in organization that had never been heard of before. A Soviet which was a workers' committee, a workers' council, um, which was an embryo of workers' power, precisely. That's the, that's the, the, the lessons that he was learning. The, this shows the independent movement of the working class and their organisations they've thrown up is the basis of a new society in the future. That was a quite an enormous uh, gain. Trotsky had the same idea. In fact, Trotsky became the leader of the Petrograd Soviet in, 19, uh, in 1905. Um, so, the, so they learned a lot out of this experience. The, the, first of all, the movement of the, of, the, of the revolution was through the working class, that was clear. They were thrown up independent organizations and they showed their capacity to struggle. All that was lacking, if you like, was the revolutionary party with the ability to pull it all together. And uh, of course, uh, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks grew enormously, by the way, because of, of revolution. In a, in a period of revolution, people would draw huge revolutionary conclusions and they looked for a revolutionary way out. So the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, all in one party, by the way, called the, the um, Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, um, that they all grew enormously. Tens of thousands joined this organisation and so on and so forth. The only thing is that uh, by the end of the year, the revolution went down. There was a defeat of the revolution. There was an insurrection in, uh, in Moscow in December, and after that there was a defeat of the revolution. And as a consequence, the Tsarist regime came with a, a male fist and, and slammed down on the working class and the revolutionary movement at, at that time. Uh, so there was a normal, a reaction came, was, in, was introduced, a period of, of reaction a period where the working class was on the retreat, where there was enormous then disillusionment. Uh, there was a big setback. The, 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 obviously, the parties began to fall apart a bit on the, under those circumstances. People committed suicide because of, of the of they had so much illusions. The thing was going to happen, and then they were destroyed because people were being sent to Siberia, were being shot, were being hanged. I mean, the regime was absolutely vicious, to say the least. So this is a period now of enormous difficulties. Having gone through 1905, now this is a period of reaction. And this period of reaction would last until 1911. 1912 was the revival. So it lasted quite a bit of time. Within that period, even uh, the Bolshevik party was very, very reduced to a skeleton, if you like, you know, under those conditions. Bear in mind that Lenin was then exiled and all the leaders practically were in exile. They couldn't uh, stay in Russia for fear of being arrested. And therefore their work was mainly abroad. 
and in Lenin's case, mainly in uh, uh, Austria and Switzerland, um, to prepare, try, trying to smuggle in, in, into uh, Russia, you know, illegal revolutionary newspapers and so on and so forth. There was a debate that took place in the Bolshevik movement, what, under the impact of this disillusionment, I would say, which was looking for an easy way out. One was saying, um, let's dissolve the party and just have an open party. Forget about the illegal, it was called liquidation, as you expect. They wanted just a legal party, a legal party. I mean, how can you have an illegal revolutionary party under Tsarism? I mean, just, it wasn't going to happen. But that was, you know, let, let's do something of that character. Then others thought, uh, you know, let's, uh, uh, you know, out to left and out to left way. Just boycott everything. Of course, you could, it was correct to boycott the Duma in a revolution because the revolution was taking over everything. You didn't want to call, call for elections under those conditions. But when it was a period of ebb, then obviously conditions changed. And they were always saying, oh, no, boycott everything. Boy. And Lenin's position, no, use every opportunity you have because there's not many there to fight for our ideas. So it would be wrong to boycott things because you'd be boycotting yourself. And therefore, try and use the, the avenues that were available. There was a bit, a bit of a, a, like a struggle within the, the Bolshevik party under those circumstances. And Lenin, if you like, stood his ground. There was, was clear, and if you can put it that way, it was clear as to what was needed at the time, not to go down the, down the road of ultra-leftism and not to go down the road of opportunism, but to steer a course to pre preserve the cadres, to educate them for the, next, for the, for the move forward. And that's, that was the whole essence of Lenin's work, I think, in these particular years. Because um, by 1912, you have a revival of the movement. You know, you can't keep the, the movement down all the time. Just like in Britain, in a sense, what have we had in Britain? I think we've had about 30 years, perhaps 40 years, of really semi-reaction semi in Britain, to be honest about it. You know, trade union membership fell by half. Number of strikes fell to the lowest level since, I think, the 1880s, right? Or the 1890s. It just collapsed. And you've had that for one reason or another. But now there's been a revival. Now they, they, they recognize that even the, even the sun, isn't it? I think the other day, I don't read it, but I saw it online, you know, a class war. They know what's coming. That's the whole point. And we should, we should understand what's coming. They've all drawn the same or similar conclusions to ourselves in that regard. And in 1912, there was a, a, a revival in Russia. And because Lenin had done the work of holding the Bolshevik party together in a, in a clear way and, 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 and educating it and training it, although it was in difficulties, by the time then this, this movement occurred in 1912, they were in a, a, a reasonably good position. So they launched a daily newspaper, an open legal daily newspaper called Pravda, it was called. And they published articles. Of course, they're, 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 you know, they've obviously been shut down by the, by the censor in many cases, but they, they tried to keep this paper going for a few years. And the readership of the paper, and, and there was the support for the Bolshevik party and the ideas it was, it was offering, grew, it was estimated, to, to, to four-fifths of the working class in Russia supported Pravda or sympathize with Pravda. It's a big support in the working class. And uh, this, was, this was obviously, you know, extremely positive. This was, they also won elections in the Duma after, you know, 1912, there's new elections. They won six MPs, if you like, in the Duma, which acted as, again, a lever to, uh, as, a, as a, a tribune for the people, to argue the case of the people, to argue the case of, of fundamental change and so on. Um, so there was quite an advance, you know, and things were looking, you know, pretty good, if you like, at that, at that time. But of course, nothing uh, stays still, as we know. And uh, I think all those commies are aware that uh, by 1914, things uh, took a turn for the worse. That is, the, the World War broke out, August 1914. An imperialist war, which had been brewing for some time because the, the rivalry of the imperialist powers... Uh, that the Second International, all the, uh, all the big socialist parties come to get passed resolutions against the war before that, and how they were going to oppose the war. Um, and that was the line that they had, right up until August 1914. And then when the test came, they capitulated. All the, all the main parties, all these socialist parties, gave in, threw, threw down this towel of internationalism, and adopted a nationalist, chauvinist position, 
of support in their own ruling class in the First World War. It was a betrayal of international socialism, a betrayal of the movement. Uh, Lenin, of course, for, to, be, to be honest, it, first of all, Lenin didn't believe what he, what, that they had betrayed. He saw the German paper called Vorwärts, and it said that he supported the war. He said he was a, it must be a forgery of the German general staff. He did not believe it. But then, obviously, it, it, it dawned obviously, <laughs> on him what the real situation uh, was, that they had betrayed the, the working class, and as Rosa Luxemburg said uh, at that time, as far as the German party was concerned, it was a stinking corpse, this organization. Now, these parties, which had betrayed the working class, could never lead the socialist revolution. They could never lead the working class to power because they have capitulated to their own bourgeoisie, their, their own ruling class. And therefore, we have to realize, said Lenin, very early on, we need a third international, a new international with a clean banner, Defended Marxism and internationalism, and he waged a war for like a, a, a campaign within, starting with the Bolshevik Party. The main enemy is at home. In other words, against this uh, poison of chauvinism, that we got more, almost, uh, you know, almost line up with the ruling class, which obviously had an impact at that time, in, in, at, at that moment in 1914, because the barrage of propaganda by the ruling class against Germany, against Russia, against all the other powers, whipping them up, you know, if you like. And that, that has happened today as well in relation to Ukraine. We know the poor Ukrainian people have been used as a pawn by Western imperialism in order to do the dirty work for Western imperialism. It is an imperialist conflict. And as a consequence, we've seen on, on the British TV and all the rest, whipping up this, this furore, you know, of uh, support for the poor. Well, we understand that, but it's done in a cynical way. They're, they're not interested in the plight of the, of the Ukrainians. They're interested in one thing, is the, that their interests of imperialism and how they can position themselves, you know, both uh, in relation to their power politics and their interests, which rules their own, uh, which rules their policies. And see, it, of course, behind them is American imperialism, the biggest imperialism of all. They're out for what? The, they're out for their own interests. Of course, they collided with Russia, but that's an, an imperialist rivalry, if you like. And uh, we, our task was to expose what was going on to cut across this sham, this propaganda that was going on, and stand, yes, as Lenin did. In other words, yes, you're in a minority. Well, so what? You know, we have to resist the, the, um, the impact, if you like, of bourgeois public opinion, because that's what it is, or petty bourgeois public opinion, which should be mobilized and can be mobilized at certain points. And the Revolutionary Party has to, has to stand up to that and stand on its principles and fight against it. Because we know that the situation will change. And this propaganda will eventually uh, die down. That they will not have the same response as they, as they have at that particular time. People will change on the basis of events. It's events that change. And they, through the experience of the World War and the bloodshed and the horror, obviously resulted in a changing consciousness of many workers and was preparing a revolution at that moment. But Lenin's, uh, if you like, role was to come out very, very hard uh, against the leaders who had betrayed and to, to fight for a, an internationalist policy. And if you like, he bent the stick to say, this is what I, we expect from every one of our comrades to, to, to understand. They must not bend to this bourgeois campaign. They must not be, uh, bend to imperialism and so on and so forth. And as a result, they stood firm. And... But they were a tiny minority. The number of, of internationalists in the world at that time was very, very small. Apart from Lenin, Trotsky, the Bolsheviks. In Britain, you had John McLean in, uh, in Scotland. You had uh, James Connolly in Ireland. You had uh, Eugene Debs in America. You had Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Lina. But it's a handful, you know, uh, struggling against the, the stream. They come together in Zimmerwald in 1915, but that's mainly a, a kind of pacifist conference, if, if the truth has been told. Lenin was on the left of that, you know, arguing for revolution, you know, arguing for the, if like civil war, that's what he was talking about, turn the war into civil war. I mean, these, these are quite uh, sharp language, and the reason why the sharpness was to pose things bluntly, not to, not to, to uh, fudge things, because the pacifists were obviously there's a lot of pacifism and ideas of that nature. Peace. There's no, how can there be peace in the middle of a, an imperialist war? We have to overthrow the ruling class if you want peace. 
And that's the way that Lenin posed it, a, rev a revolutionary approach to the, sec to, the, to the First World War itself. But he was isolated. I mean, he, he was in, uh, well, in Switzerland. He went to Austria. He was hounded of Austria. He went to Switzerland and uh, trying to camp, you know, hold the thing together from abroad. The war, he said, uh, he, he, he gave a lecture, actually, in January 1917 to uh, young socialists in Switzerland, Swiss young socialists. It was a lecture about the, the lessons of the 1905 revolution. And in it, at the end, he says, uh, look, I know that Europe appears to be a graveyard. You know, it's, 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 it's dead, it's shattered. There's no movement out there, apart from the war, the din of the war. He says, but what is being prepared is a revolution. That's what's being prepared now. And they were all quite uh, taken aback by this, this, this incredible uh, prophecy, if you like, that revolution is being prepared in Europe. But he did say that, uh, I, I, he said, well, I, I'm getting on now, he said, and probably the older generation will not see it in my time, he said. It'll be the youth that carries through the revolution. And yet, within one month, the Tsar had fallen and the Russian Revolution had, uh, it, it, uh, had taken place. Shows sh sharp and sudden changes in the situation, as we say, which is prevalent that we have at the present time. It shows the, the, the enormous instability and crisis underlying society. That's the reasons uh, for it. So we had this, um, this, the revolution breaking out in Russia in February 1917. The Bolsheviks didn't win a majority. They only had 8,000 members at that time in February 1917. The Mensheviks actually had a bigger force, mainly because they mainly had intellectuals and people, the people, people knew them and so on and so forth. They took the line of least resistance, I suppose. A provisional government was established. The, the Tsar had been overthrown, and what else happened? Soviets were created by the working class. That was the decisive uh, feature of the revolution. But Lenin shows the genius of Lenin. He recognized that the whole situation had fu fundamentally changed. You're a bourgeois government. You've got the Soviets being, being established, big organizations, which could have taken power at that time, by the way. They, had, they were so powerful. The bourgeois were very, very, very weak. And yet they were propping up a, a bourgeois government. The Soviets were, through the Menshevik majority, were propping up the bourgeois uh, government. And uh, from a, actually from, a, from a, a Switzerland, he wrote a telegram, no confidence in this bourgeois government. No confidence in Kerensky above all. Uh, only have confidence in yourselves, the independent movement of the working class. That initials, initial reaction. Because there were those in Russia, even in the Bolshevik party, who are wavering, you know, oh, you know, intoxicated by revolution. Oh, look at this, it's, it's all happening, you know. And, but uh, no, Lenin had a very level head. And then he suggested, he came back, he wrote what, what, what was called Letters from Afar. These, these uh, several letters he wrote before leaving um, uh, Switzerland, which basically said, There's a, this is just the beginning of a revolution. That is, we get, there's going to be a second phase of the revolution where the working class will come to power, and we can have, it'll be a socialist revolution. He'd never said that before. It's what Trotsky said in 1904, 1905, permanent revolution. He'd come over to that kind of position. And uh, when he went to the, to the Bolsheviks and coming back from exile, he had to have a conference how he got here. He had to argue to change this perspective to, from this, uh, you know, modernized bourgeois state. No, we want a socialist revolution. He was in the minority of one. He, the others were just astounded. What the hell is Lenin on about? You know, he's gone mad talking about. And the, on the basis of his, his, his powers of persuasion, particularly of the worker members of the Bolshevik Party, who were more closer to the revolutionary feelings of the masses, he was able to convince the majority of the Bolshevik organization, the Bolshevik Party at that time, because it, it became a party in 1912. So it was the Bolshevik Party that their task now is to prepare a second revolution uh, for the working class to come to power, a socialist revolution, as the beginning of a world revolution. It wasn't a Russian revolution. It was the beginning of the world revolution. That's the way he saw it. Not like later on, the Stalinists were saying you know, socialism in one country and all the rest. It's nonsense. Lenin always says it's the world revolution which is more important. This is just the beginning of it. And therefore, that was the plan. That was the idea. He won over the Bolshevik party. And then skillfully, if you like, was able to, to uh, patiently explain these ideas. They, they were growing, they were developing the Bolshevik Party. 
and winning over sections of workers who obviously were impatient because of the war, the, 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 the lack of food, the lack of bread, and, and obviously the, the peasant who were, in, were up in arms as well because they didn't have any land. And they used the slogans, bread, land, and peace, all power to the Soviets. Because the Soviets were in the hands of the right wing, were in the hands of the reformers. So he said, yeah, but we can patiently win them over. We'll win the working class over by propaganda, by, by agitation. And that's exactly what happened. Because the, the old regime couldn't answer the problems, couldn't bring about uh, peace, couldn't give the workers bread, couldn't give the la land to the peasants. They, they did nothing. They were impotent. All they wanted was pursue the war. Let's, let's keep the war going. That was the, the whole basis of their program. So the Bolsheviks were able to, to gain more and more of a majority, even by, by June, when the, the, the Soviet, the, when the Mensheviks had to call a demonstration of the Soviets, and they thought they'd had the majority, all the placards came out in the demo, all power to the Soviets, bread, land, and peace. It was all the Bolshevik slogans. And, uh, and this, that was that intolerable. And that's why they launched uh, a campaign then of slander against the Bolshevik party. Lenin was, they denounced Lenin as, a, as a, a German agent, of course, that's the usual stuff, using a German agent, which was obviously serious because if they arrested him as being a German agent, they would have shot him. And the party advised him to go underground and he fled to, to Finland at that time. Uh, just like, unfortunately, what should have happened to, to, to um, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg because they were hunted as well in January 1919 by the counter-revolution. And uh, instead of escaping Berlin, which they should have done and gone into hiding, they didn't, and they were caught. And when they were caught, they were murdered. And that's what would have happened to, to Lenin if he hadn't escaped at that particular time. And from exile, he was, uh, I would say, um, in touch with the comrades from Finland, in touch with the Bolsheviks, who are now underground party. They smashed up all their printing presses. They drove them underground. They arrested the leaders. Trotsky was in, in jail, and other leaders were, were put in jail. And uh, they were only released in August when there was a counter-revolution taking place of Kornilov. General Kornilov was marching his troops to overthrow the provisional government. And they were so terrified, they allowed the Bolsheviks uh, to, to act, if you like, which they did act to um, subvert the counter-revolution. But in doing so, they won more support. And by September, October, they won the overwhelming support of the, of the support in the Soviets, in Moscow, in Petersburg, and, lot, and many others as well. And Lenin, from afar, was demanded they take power, all power to the Soviets. If we've got a majority, they should take power. The party now should be on course for insurrection. And, uh, of course, they were... Those in the party and the leadership were a bit hesitant about this, and uh, that's what you always have—a crisis within the party. In one sense, it's a, a decisive turn, isn't it? In events, this is not just you know go about your daily paper sailing around the corner. This is actually preparing to take power. And because Trotsky was in a position as the leader or became a leader of the mili revolutionary military committee, because they wanted—that was, that was a, the garrison in, in, in Petrograd in that, in that sense—they were able, to, under his tutelage we were able to organize the insurrection which took place on the 25th of October, the old calendar, on the 7th of November, which happened to be Trotsky's birthday. What a great uh, birthday present. <laughs> they came, it came about, Lenin comes into the hall, the old leaders of the, of the Soviets disappear, they scuttle out, and basically Lenin says, this, we, are, we are here to create a new world order. You know, and uh, this was a revolution in the making, and uh, this was an amazing feat that shook the entire world uh, despite everything. But the only way this could come about was the Bolshevik party. Without the party, it would not be possible to do anything. You, you cannot just improvise a party. The whole role of Lenin, and he, was, he, I would say, was the most advanced thinker in relation to the importance of the party. Trotsky, no. Luxembourg, no. None of, the, none of the leaders understood the real significance and importance of building the revolutionary party but Lenin. And that's what he devoted his life to do, build this, this instrument, this steeled instrument of those who are prepared to make this understood and prepared to put their lives on the line to carry through the revolution. And he, he, he gathered those two together. They became the cadres on which they were able to win the working class under those revolutionary conditions. But if it, wasn't, if it didn't exist, it wouldn't have happened. 
I think Trotsky compared it to a piston box, you know, and the energy of the mass is like steam. You know, the energy, steam is very powerful. You put it through a piston box, it can drive a locomotive. But if it, without the piston box, it dissipates into the air. It's nothing. And that's where the energy of the masses has to be directed to take power. That's the basis of the Revolutionary Party. And that's what we're trying to create today for the revolutionary events that are coming in Britain. You cannot wait in order to build the party as it comes along. You have to organize it, train it, educate it, pull it together, shape it, if you like, on the basis of the experience of Bolshevism, of Lenin, and the experience of the last hundred years as well, of learning what, what the score is. In that way, preparing for the ground uh, that uh, emerges. They came to power. I haven't got, I've run out of time, basically. But Lenin, they come to power, but they knew that they would have to extend the revolution internationally. They couldn't have socialism in Russia. It was too backward. You know, 70% of the people were illiterate. It's a backward country. It, you couldn't establish a material ba new class society on that basis. It needed to extend it to the West, and that's what they tried to do. In 1919, they established the Communist International, the Third International. And with that, they put a call out for the formation of communist parties all over the world. And within a year, huge communist parties, out of the old organizations, a crisis emerged, and mass communist parties were created in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Czechoslovakia, a whole number of countries, apart from Britain, which was very, very small. That's another, another, another uh, lesson going to at another time, uh, probably. But here showed the potential. But unfortunately, a revolutionary tie did break out as well after the, after the, 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 the First World War, but it was betrayed. These young communist parties either didn't exist or they were very, very embryonic. And therefore the leadership fell to the social democracy. Your uh, reformist leaders who then betrayed the working class. Power could have been in the hands of the German working class in November 1918, but it was squandered. You know, all the attempts of the working class to come to the power, as Trotsky summed it up, didn't he? The crisis of, of, of mankind is a crisis of leadership. The revolutionary leadership, that's the essence, that's the, the real essence. And he hoped that the Third International would solve that problem. Unfortunately, uh, Lenin um, uh, had been shot in 1918 by a social revolution, left social revolutionary. He had a stroke in 1922, then a series of stroke, strokes that put him out of action. And by that time, you had the growing bureaucracy within the Soviet Union. Uh, because of the backward country, very, very few people could read and write. The old officials started to come back in the state apparatus. And Stalin was the figurehead of this bureauc bureaucracy in Russia itself. And when uh, Lenin was on his deathbed, he carried out a struggle with Trotsky, alongside Trotsky, against bureaucracy within Russia itself, asking for the removal of Stalin. Unfortunately, he was paralyzed, and then he died. And then there was a maneuver against uh, Trotsky, and he was sidelined. And eventually, as we know, um, Trotsky was expelled from the Soviet Union, uh, launched the idea of a new international, the Fourth International. Unfortunately, in 1940, he was hunted down and murdered. His whole family had been wiped out, actually. So he, he, st he was the standard bearer for Lenin. If you want a continuation, like Lenin continued the struggle of Marx and Engels when they died. But when Lenin died, it was Trotsky who carried on the struggle of defense of Marxism. And we, our heritage, goes back to those days of the Russian Revolution, of Trotsky's left opposition. We are the, the comrade who founded our tendency. Ted Grant uh, was brought up in the left opposition and uh, in, uh, absorbed the ideas and prepared the way for the defense of those ideas that we have today. Our tendency, the international Marxist tendency, internationally, as the only ideas that can overthrow capitalism, win a majority in the working. There's no one else. There's just no one else. The sex don't make me laugh. The reformists, where we, we've had a guts full of what the reformists are, are capable of doing. They have no faith whatsoever in revolution. Revolution, they have a good laugh about that. They, they have no idea what's coming. Therefore, we alone have that responsibility. It sounds like an enormous task, as Lenin pointed out to the young socialists in January 1917, what's coming. But events, comrades, Events will throw up this revolutionary movement. But if we have the embryo, we, we develop a, a small organization that has the capacity, then we can build on that. We can grow from five, ten thousand, fifty thousand, 10,000, 50,000, and become a factor in the situation. A British revolution on the cards, 
A successful revolution will transform the entire world. It would set the whole world alight. And that's what our aim is. On the basis of this crisis coming up, we, and we alone, if we do our job correctly, if we put ourselves on the line, and if we if like link up with the best workers in Britain, we can overthrow capitalism and lay the basis of the Socialist Republic in Britain as the basis for the world revolution itself. That's the uh, lesson of Lenin. That's the lesson of Bolshevism. And we must learn it.